Afganistan, Pakistan, Libanan. Եվ ինչը վերջերս Հուսաստանդեն էր մետնում, որ դանան է և երուսալիմը, այն թերդերթու ոպնոտիզմի ռոպսի խոսնովի։ Ինչը այդ ամբող տարածաշուջանի գրասանյակների պիստոնական ծրազազած Whatever that she says about me is true. And if you want to hear more, you should ask my wife. She knows everything else. Բանը, ուրեմ մեկ ուտաց մենք միատ ավոտ կանենք, ուրեթով միատ մեն բոլորիս կողմից ավոտ կանի, հետո սկսենք ա։ Համեն որ երով ու ես ուտքով կողմեն։ Մերտեր իսուս կսկոս որում են կոսուս պանում մերտեր կիչ մեր աստված։ Շնորակալին ատոր մենք մեկ տեղ են եկել կարանումոր խնձում ենք հոստուս անվան, որ մեզ մեր ասանվող չեն պասկել, պասկես մեր են որ մեր կերոջ համար, իրենց հաստեր դեղնադրավորդներս մեն շնոր իմաստությությությությությությությությությությու հարքիտ համար թոքովույս է կավետանը պարացվի են ծարայության միջոցով։ Հարքես ամեն։ Սարդիտ մեջ ինչ աստված թերելա մեր էտ գիստի։ The first time I visited Armenia, uh, towards the end of my trip, I was asking Karine if there is such a thing as a renewal movement within the Armenian Apostolic Church. And uh, I don't remember well, but I think she didn't know much about this. <laughs> And, uh, in, in a meeting I had with one of the evangelical leaders there here, he mentioned that there is a, a brotherhood of the Armenian Apostolic Church. And then I made my eyes very wide open because it sounded like a renewal movement in the Romanian Orthodox Church in Romania. It's called the uh, Rolo's Army. So we got a telephone number, we called Brother Hamlet, and we met. And he told me the story of the brotherhood, and I was fascinated with it. And then uh, later on, I put it on my blog, and many people became fascinated with your story. Եվ 
And I'm very glad to hear now that you're working at the History, uh, the Brotherhood, and I really hope it will be finished well and it will be translated into English because unfortunately nobody, I mean very few people in the world speak the language of heaven. <laughs> so uh, I, I was uh, told that uh, you meet regularly here to talk about uh, fathers and mothers. About family issues. <coughs> and um, I would like to share with you something that is very much lately on my heart. And it's not so much about the Father Heart of God. You may have heard a lot about them. I want to talk to you a little bit about the mother heart of God. You know, much of Christianity is dominated by men, by male. And of course, uh, this kind of male domination in Christianity has some roots in Christian language. <coughs> the Bible calls God Father. And they call Jesus Christ the Son. Not God the Mother and God the Daughter. But from this, often, people draw immediately gender and uh, implications. <laughs> it's as if God is a man, not a woman. And uh, men have something special, and they should be the bosses. That of course, in most Christian traditions, only men can be priests, only men can serve the Eucharist. <laughs> that women can be at best servants. Can be? can be at best servants of their husbands or of men in general. Women become a sort of appendixes to men. I mean, this world, this world is all about men, and women have to help men to fulfill what they think has to be fulfilled. Uh, to be fair, I think something is wrong with this picture. <coughs> Uh, but I have to admit that men have sometimes strong arguments for their power and domination position. Doesn't the Bible say that the woman has first eaten from the fruit? Or not from the forbidden fruit. And only after that, the man listen to her and he shouldn't obey her. He, he also ate from the fruit 
and then the disasters began. And you remember probably from uh, uh, the chapter 3 in Genesis, God came in the garden and asked who? What happened? He didn't ask her, he asked him. Why? Because he was in charge. And how did he respond? <coughs> the woman that you gave me. Not me. It's either you or her or the serpent, but not me. Very responsible. Huh? I guess our wives uh, are familiar with this picture. <coughs> because since the garden we repeat it over and over again. I am a great fan of uh, Celtic spirituality. Uh, Celtic tribes lived somewhere in the north of the uh, Black Sea, not far from this place. And a few centuries before Christ, they migrated across Europe and landed in Spain, France, and then finally in Ireland. <coughs> and uh, I, uh, France and Ireland. And they have created their own culture there. They were uh, pagans. They are priests called the Druids were those who had uh, spiritual control of uh, that culture. But quite early, in the first centuries, Christian missionaries brought the gospel in Ireland. In the fifth century, uh, a young man was taken hostage by pirates on the west side of England. By pirates, by Celtic pirates. And he was brought to Ireland and made slave. He was born in a Christian family, but he was not a committed Christian. But there, as he was a shepherd, kind of like the prodigal son at the pigs. He remembered the God of his parents and he asked God to save him. His, his real name is known by, by a few, but he's known in history as St. Patrick. Because he was a patrician, he was a son of a noble. God responded to his prayer and he had a vision uh, that the next day he has to leave that place and travel back to England. <coughs> and 
that was a dangerous trip because he was a slave. And then who was going to, was going to accept him on a ship to cross the sea? <laughs> God, who gave him this vision, mm -hmm. opened the way and he was able to reach home. Mm -hmm. There, he dedicated his life to Christ. And then his family sent him to France to study theology. And then he came back and he was ordained as a bishop. And then the Holy Spirit came again to him in a vision and told him, you have to go back to Ireland. He was a little bit scared, but God put the love, a love of God for Irish people and he went there. <coughs> he was a courageous missionary and through him the Irish came to Christ. About a hundred years later, one of the people who grew up in, in, in the kind of spirituality that he promoted in Ireland, a monk whose name was uh, Columcil or Columba, Dov, a man whose cross I wear, I mean, I don't mean he wore this cross, I mean this is called Saint Columba Cross. Uh, left Ireland with twelve of his disciples. And stopped on a tiny island called Iona. And there he established a little monastic community. He preached the gospel. People came to Christ. And then the Spirit spoke again to them and sent them to preach the gospel in Britain on the larger island. And then they crossed on the continent and established monasteries all over Europe up to the north of my country in Ukraine. Some of these monasteries became extremely influential in church history. I'll give just two examples. St. Francis of Assisi grew up and got his vision for his, this is an amazing ministry he had, in a, a monastery established by Celtic monks. And Martin Luther, he also grew up and, and got his vision of faith in an, a monastery established by God. Why did I tell you this? <coughs> because the kind of spirituality that the Celts have built is very different from the Roman Catholic type of spirituality. Let me tell you a few of the traits of Celtic spirituality. It was a very biblical 
spirituality. Many of the Celtic uh, monks memorized the whole New Testament and some of them the whole Bible. Every one of them knew all the Psalms by heart. They were also a very ascetic kind of spirituality. They were treating their bodies harshly, keeping them under control. The spiritual discipline that, that St. Columba respected the most was the following. Every morning he bared himself up to the waist, took his clothes up to the waist. He entered the sea and recited the, the Psalter, the Psalms, the whole book of Psalms. Every day. Winter, spring, summer, every day. They were also a very inclusive type of spirituality. I will, explain. I will explain what inclusive means. There are two approaches to culture in the history of the church. So one I call exclusive, the other one I call inclusive. Uh, the, 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 the exclusive pers uh, approach says that if something comes from other than Christian sources, it has to be rejected. The inclusive attitude says certain things in culture can be redeemed and should be redeemed, and others cannot. Based on this attitude, they have redeemed Christmas. The celebration of Christ's birth. No? We know that Christ was not born on the 25th of December, do we? He was born in spring. Why do we celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December? Very simple. It was the Saturnalia, a very pagan Roman celebration. A very sinful kind of celebration. So the church father said, what can we do? We can forbid people to do the Saturnalia. Or we can turn it into a Christian celebration. Which they did. And because I believe inclusiveness is the, the best approach, I think they did a very good thing. But those who do not believe in church history and in roots and in church fathers, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they say, no, we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. The Celts redeemed a lot of traits of their culture. For instance, uh, Irish people were very close to nature. They had they venerated trees or springs. So Christian Irish priests, instead of saying don't do this, don't go there, they used those things in a Christian way. 
Հոխանակ ասեն մի արեք սարսխալ է, խոխեցին դրայդ եվ դարձրինք Հիստոնյա ձերի։ If you read their prayers, their nature is everywhere. Եթե կարթակ իրան ծաղոտքները, բնությունը ամեն տեղը իրան ծաղոտքի մեջ։ Every element of nature speaks to them about God, about their life of Christ. In opposition, if you look at Western Christianity, nature has no place in it almost. It's like man is against nature, rather than man is humanity is part of nature. I don't know how familiar you are with Celtic prayer. My favorite prayer is what is called St. Patrick's breastplate, plate, the shield of St. Patrick. Which is an amazing, amazing prayer. Which basically tries to close the whole of life in prayer and the presence of God. In, in the center of the prayer is this affirmation, Christ is ahead of me, Christ is behind me. Christ is about me, Christ is beneath me. Christ is inside me, Christ is outside of me. I want to see Christ in the eyes of those who look at me. It's unbelievable. You, you should get this prayer and translate it into Armenian if it's not. It's beautiful. It is also profoundly Trinitarian. The Trinity is present in every prayer of the Celts. It is also a spirituality which celebrates the communion of the saints. Communion of the saints. The fact that the living saints and those saints who are in heaven are one. Let me explain. One of my favorite Celtic stories comes from Scotland. One Scottish minister went one day to visit an old lady who was living far away from the community. And there the minister uh, wanted to sort of uh, comfort the lady who was so lonely. And she said, I'm so sorry for you. You know, you stay here alone every day. You must feel lonely. <coughs> He said to her, she wanted to comfort her. And he complained and said, but no, sir, I'm never alone. I'm with her, with the Holy Virgin, and with him, with Jesus, and with the saints, I'm never alone. This is the kind of spirituality that the Celts were promoting. Their monasteries were not far away from the community, but in the middle of the community. They were hospitals and schools and helpers, everything. And something else, very important for the topic that you're discussing here. It is not a hierarchical type of church like the Roman Catholic Church. It's a very flat church. 
Of course, because early Christianity comes from a very misogyne, men-dominated society, still men were priests. But many times bishops were going to confession to abbesses, to heads, women heads of monasteries. Some of the Celtic saints like St. Gilda had more respect than men saints of that time. Women and men were equal. They were not identical, of course. I mean, you, it's enough to look at the physical. We're not identical. But they were equal in value. No one was over the other. But sometimes men, because of his gifts, was making a decision all the times women were. And that created harmony. But at the end of the 4th century, beginning of the 5th, the church, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, was very, very influenced by a man called Augustine. Now, Augustine is one of the greatest, Augustinus, he, he was one of the greatest geniuses of the church, one of the best theologians that the church ever had. His work on the Trinity is amazing. His uh, confessions is an amazing work. We can learn a lot from him. But he had a problem. He had a problem. Two of them, but let me talk about one. The second one was, uh, was his Neoplatonism. Uh, but the first one is that before becoming a Christian, he lived a life of debauchery. Sinfulness. Before becoming a Christian, he wasted every woman he could put his hand on. Because of this experience, when he became a Christian, he started hating women. And he is one of those who elaborated this theology that women cannot have sacramental roles. And others continue this argument after him. I mean, if you, if you listen to St. Thomas Aquinas talking about women, you will be scared to death. Absolutely stupid things that they are saying. I mean, smart people. Uh, for them, the woman is worse than the devil. To be fair, I'm not going to buy or swallow this kind of rubbish. It's not coming from the Bible. Just two days ago, I heard that a, a, a senator in the parliament of Zimbabwe suggested that the problem, the solution to the problem of AIDS in Zimbabwe is the following. Women should raise their hair. And should stop washing themselves. So that men would not chase women. It didn't occur to the stupid guy to castrate the stupid men who are chasing women. 
I mean, the same with the issue of prostitution. What do states do to solve prostitution? Two things. Either legalize prostitution, which is giving official stamp to sinfulness, or criminalize prostitutes. Yeah. Why does prostitution exist? Because there is a need for it. Who needs it? Man. Criminalize consumption and there will be no prostitution. <laughs> God has created this world in his image and especially humanity. And, and men, males, have turned this world according to their own fallen image. This is the world in which we live. A man, a world made according to the image of men, of humans. And that's why the world is so distorted. There is, there is a, I mean, women could not create serious production. I mean, you know, in our factories, all objects are the same, you know? We all have in our homes furniture that is, looks the same, clothes that look the same, shoes that look the same. Only a man's mind, distorted mind, can create a stupid idea. Why did we do this? Because it's effective. Who cares if it's ugly? As long as it's effective. There is an amazing book that I highly recommend to you. The author is a Swiss psychologist. His name is Paul Tournier. <coughs> His book is in French. It's called La Mission de la Femme. The Mission of the Femme. Of the, of the In this book, he basically proves that the world is so ugly because it is created by men for men. And women have no choice than to suffer it. I have to confess to you that I am a feminist theologian. And by this I mean the following. All the authors of the Bible are men. Most theologians in church history were men. Most preachers in churches are men. When you go to a marriage, what do you ladies hear? Submit to your husbands. Who's saying that to you? A man. And to be fair, I'm suspicious. Is he preaching for his own benefit or for your benefit? Now, I, I'm not preaching here disobedience of women to men. But more than being obeyed, I want to be respected. And I think that is what the, the spirit of the command is in scripture. But we like to be bosses, to give orders and to be listened to, obeyed.
This is not coming from God, this is coming from our fallen nature. God has a much tougher command for men on a marriage. Men love your wives as Christ loved his church and gave his life for her. I don't hear many sermons about that. You know what? If women would be preachers, I bet we'll hear more sermons about it. So, I'm a feminist theologian. Because there is too much male emphasis in the way we teach scripture that somebody has to bring some balance. And because a number of years I have taught hermeneutics, the science of interpretation, I want to add one more thing. We need to listen to women interpreting scriptures. You know, when we read scripture, we read it with our whole being. With our knowledge of culture and language, of biblical history and church history. But more than that, we read it with our psyche, with our mental structures, with our emotional structures, through the lenses of our experience, <coughs> and even who we are at the most intimate level, which is ourselves, our DNA. All this helps us interpret scripture in a certain way. The fact that I never had a period that I never gave birth or gone through uh, um, uh, menopause affects the way I interpret scripture. And the presence of those experiences in a woman makes women see in scripture something that I would never see. And this is beautiful. This is the this is the mystery of the church. In which men have to listen to women and women to men. Romanians have to listen to Armenians, Armenians to Romanians. And believe me, Americans have to listen to Armenians, Armenians to Americans, or Russians, or Chinese. Because we all have a partial vision of the truth. We need the whole body. But because the world is fundamentally made of men and women, we have to hear all the voices, the voices of men and the voices of women. If we don't, we'll have a partial view of the truth, we'll be poorer and less at what God wants us to be. I'm fascinated with Celtic spirituality because they were able to bring this balance which is missing in most of Christianity. I commend to you Celtic spirituality. You can learn a lot from it.
Thank you for your patience with me. Please correct all my heresies, brother. No, no. <laughs> uh, the rats are for, for men and for women. Yes, and Tani Kisser told us that men are men are Kina and Skasre. Family research that we are having all this done by women. Men Kira Shkiro, Nayatik, the through her hmm. eyes, through her senses, we find out that we are not good in our own. We are really far from the truth of the gospel. Especially Christians. We are really far from the truth of the gospel. And this brings us to the question. Not on the cause, of course. As you know, the founder of Brotherhood was the woman. And many brothers come to God yes. to yeah. And this makes us only happy, this us happiness. And I like to establish In the 90s. Catholics are part of the world of the was being the first invited more than hundred people And asked what difficulties do you have? And we said that some, there are some opinions that we should not preach in a And shouldn't leave the groups. So. They, the church in China, which is probably the most dynamic church in the world, is led by women. Of course, men go to conferences, but women keep the church alive. They are teachers, they are counselors. Most of men are in prison. If men would lead the church, the church would die. Thank God for Krishna women. You know, brother, because you told me so much about the brotherhood, I know that women have a prominent place in your ministry. I would have said the same thing if it was a misogyny meeting. 
But I, I don't necessarily seek to be stoned, you know, and killed. Uh, I will do it from a distance. But I know I'm among friends, so. Uh, and uh, that, what you are doing here can be an example for many Christians, for many Christian communities. Because I see.